Okay, we're actually live now. Uh, okay, sorry guys. Uh, hopefully you can hear me live and clear. Welcome to the Wise Wall Show. Um, we were just live for like the last five minutes and I had it listed as unlisted. So none of you guys got a notification. I was live talking to myself and it's so fitting because 42 weeks now, 42 weeks I've been going live for the Wise Wall Show. So this is episode number 42. If you've just found this now, Go back and watch the playlist for The Wise Wall Show. We've had some awesome opportunities to have good guests on and a lot of good deep talks. A couple hours each stream in most cases. Um, <laughs> hey, we're actually using my phone. 100% uh, I did break the uh, power cord when I tripped last video, unfortunately. So that felt pretty bad. But we're gonna get some cool stuff. Let me know if you guys can see this. I got a full floor to ceiling um, whiteboard. It's, it literally goes all the way to the floor and all the way. So uh, yeah, okay, good. So it's reversed on my camera, but you guys, you guys can see the numbers properly. That was the test. We were, we were curious if the phone was going to shoot back backwards or if it was going to work. It looks like it's going to work. I need to wet this. I'm gonna just wet somehow. Um, welcome, welcome to the stream. Lobadal, first time in the stream. Mike, good to see you on. Eric, good to see you on. Brandon, good to see you on as well. Um, smash the like button if you're just jumping into the stream. What we're gonna do on this stream, you guys are wondering like, what's with this title, right? It's like, um, of course, episode 42, right? It's the answer. Remember the, the what is it? Uh, Hitchhiker's Traveler's Guide to the Universe or whatever. The answer is 42. The answer to everything, the universe, all of it. But in this video, I did a joke and I said the answer to everything is early retirement. Because for a long time, Austin, good to see you on. For a long time, I did believe the answer to everything was early retirement, straight up. I thought, oh, thank you. Straight up, I thought that the answer to everything was early retirement. I thought it would solve all of my problems. I thought that, you know, as soon as you're early retired and you have all this free time, every problem you have before is going to go away. Like, you know, physical fitness. Before I thought, you know, I'll be so ripped when I'm really retired. The truth is, I'm not, I mean, I'm in decent shape, but I'm not any more ripped than I really was before. Um, nothing really is new. William, good to see you on. Sorry I'm late, guys. We had some technical difficulties. Like I said earlier in the stream, when I started off, I was streaming unlisted. So no one was seeing the stream and I was just talking to myself. And I'm like, why is no one getting notification to come on to the live stream? Hey, good to see you on. Really appreciate all the information you give out, especially today. Thanks, thanks, appreciate that. Um, episode 42, right? 42 weeks, guys. People have been following my channel now for 42 weeks. I've been going live every single Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern, without a fail. Even when I'm sick, even when I was in Newfoundland, even when I'm on vacation, no matter where I am, I go live for you guys. That's my dedication to this channel. Um, and to you guys, really, at the end of the day, the core, like, 40 that watch this stream, and then there's, like, 300 of you guys that watch the replay. They're, like, my core, I call you guys my core 300. I know not everyone's going to like this. Um, let me move this, get my lighting better. Uh, is that better, guys? I was actually just about to add another light to it. Hit the board in the background. Oh. Uh, that make things worse, make things better. You tell me. Gabe, good to see you on. Gabe, man, good to see you on the live stream. This guy, check his channel out. Um, he did a video on on frugal living. The editing was on point. I loved in the beginning you had the thermostat and you had like the coffee with the uh, the steam coming off of it. Your channel's gonna blow up, man, like huge. I'm I'm so blinded by this light down here. You're killing me, Captain. I can't, turn. I can't see anything. You guys, can see, you guys need to see this light, like. It's actually gonna kill you guys. Like, it is, the camera doesn't even do it justice. How, like, I literally can't even see the camera right now. That's how, wow. Okay, I think I'm still alive. Um, we're gonna talk in this video though about, for those people who are waiting now, what, like 10 minutes in or something. We're gonna talk about how to flip properties and how to buy businesses. And then whatever questions you guys have. So drop the questions into the comments. Creates a ton of shadow. I think, let's just turn it off. It's, I, kill, I can't see anything. Yeah. I can't see. <laughs> that light is too powerful. That's like a, we put that on the backdrop. But this, this backdrop sucks for, because the reflection. I don't know how we can, get, how do you get the good lighting here? I don't know. I don't know. Um, but anyway, Gabe, good to see you on. I did really appreciate um, your video a little bit ago there. I wonder if I turn these, it would fix the lighting issue. It might, yeah. yeah reflect some. I don't know if it's going to fix. Oh, well. Anyway, for the guys who are here, I should be at a networking event right now. Um, yeah, thanks, Gabe. Appreciate that. We've 
you know, I just started to get our, our camera game up a bit, our editing game up a bit. For a long time, like I'm streaming from my phone right now, actually, but for a long time we were having amateur hour with the T5i and we were just working on a lot of kinks. We're getting a lot better. Media, not my back, not my strong suit, not my background. Editing, again, not my strong suit, not my background. Real estate, personal finance, that's my jam, right? I can talk about that all day long. People have questions about anything related to personal finance. I've read it all. Um, it comes to everything, pretty much. Um, real estate's been my, my bread and butter, too. So hopefully I can add some value for you tonight. It's great to see you on. I, you know, I think your channel is going to have, you know, we got like 4,000 something subscribers now. You'll probably have like 10,000 in the next two months. That one video you did was really on point. Um, you figured out the algorithm with that one. I don't know what you did. You got to share the secrets. Okay, so Brandon says he can't tell the difference off or on. Um, yeah, so let's let's whiteboard some stuff here. I want to talk. I want to do a couple segments on buying businesses, but I have this idea where I kind of shared it on. I went live on Instagram and on Facebook before I started the stream. Before I spent ten minutes just talking to myself online. Um, <laughs> that's why we're late yet again today. But uh, I was talking about the idea of flipping businesses and flipping real estate. So what is flipping a business? Flipping a business is going and buying an established business. So you might buy like a distribution business, you might buy you know, marketing business, you might any business, pick a you know, franchised Taco Bell or something, or you buy something, buy some business, you turn around a portion of the business. So you either reduce costs or you drive up revenue. So maybe it's, a, it's an old business and it needs some online presence and you build a brand, you build up their online sales, you build the, the business up, by driving costs down, right? Cost of goods sold, or SGNA. SGNA SG stands for um, general, like administrative type expenses. Anything below, like the the cost of goods sold, so your advertising expenses, your salaries, stuff like that, right? You can make a business more efficient, and then you drive the value up because businesses sell based on EBITDA. And those people who don't know what EBITDA is. I'm gonna explain what it is. So it's earnings before. Uh, interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So you basically make an adjustment to the net income of the business, the net profit on their income statement, and you basically normalize it. So oftentimes there'll be an owner who's working in the business, and you'll take, if their salary is you know, 50 grand a year, you might say a replacement for that person would be 70,000. So you make an adjustment of $20,000 negative to the EBITDA. And basically businesses trade on a multiple of EBITDA. So times EBITDA. Every industry is slightly different. You might see like two times EBITDA, five times EBITDA. It depends on the stability of the industry. It depends on the stability of what you're buying, right? If the business is really solid. I also have seen revenue multiples. I've seen people trade on one times revenue, two times revenue, if, there isn't, if it isn't a very profitable business. Um, but more often than not, if you're an investor buying a business, like, like I am when I buy businesses, I'm looking at EBITDA. I'm thinking, what can the EBITDA be? I don't want to pay for any future growth ever. I only want to pay for current Valuation, really important to only pay for what is currently here. You don't pay for projected, you pay for what is here now. What are the sales right now? If you transform the business, that's you adding value. If you grow sales, you make things more efficient, that's you adding value at the end of the day. And I don't think you should pay for your own efforts, your own value add. You need to pay for what's there currently right now. So when I buy businesses, I buy with an EBITDA, I increase EBITDA by driving sales up, right, sales. Screw that up a little bit. I can do better. That was too hard to read for you guys, probably. That's probably better. So I drive sales up. That's revenue. Revenue is sales, so the same thing. I drive it up and I drive costs. So co COGS is cost of goods sold. So I drive the cost of goods sold down by buying in greater volume. Say I'm selling, I don't know, how about this? A sheet of paper. Say I'm selling paper. Right now they're selling a million, million dollars in paper a year. I go and find a better supplier, a better just distributor, um, that sort of thing. And then I basically take this piece of paper and uh, I buy more of it at a cheaper price. And then maybe I brand this paper as like the best quality paper for writing on with a dry erase marker. And all of a sudden I'm able to sell a lot more of it because I built a brand around that. The cool thing is with building a brand, when you become less like a commodity and more like a brand, your evidence multiple gets higher. So you're more valuable because there's more um, resiliency in what you're selling. So that's that's... Basic fundamentals. At the end of the day, feel free to ask questions if you have any. Um, that's the the basic underlying assumption of flipping businesses. So I go in, I buy businesses 
that are self-sustaining without my involvement. So I like businesses that have five, 10 employees, 15 employees, that's like the sweet spot. The bigger the business, the better actually, because it runs better without the owner. You don't want an owner operated like, just thinking like a machine shop or something where if that owner's gone, he's impossible to replace. You don't want a business like that. You want a business that when the owner's gone, it's saleable. That doesn't mean necessarily I don't go into a business where there is an owner that runs everything right now, have him transition out over a two year period and you know, give them a contract value where they stay on. That's important. You want them to stay on and transition and train their replacement. Let's say I could do that. Then the business is running without the owner. It's worth double or triple what it was before. So let's say you flip businesses. And honestly, if you look at the net worth of, of the ultra wealthy, people who have net worths of like 500 K to like 2 million, their largest asset class, real estate. You look at people whose net worth is 2 million, to a billion, all the higher net worth people, you look at all those guys, 80 to 90% of their wealth is in business ownership, and they're 10% usually in real estate. So as you get really, really wealthy, you transition away from just real estate to businesses. I have a business that does real estate, like I happen to own a property management company, a construction company, and an asset, you know, basically an asset management sort of company. Um, so, you know, that's at the end of the day, that's what it's all about is, is that transition. So I'm at that transition point now where I'm in, I'm in this category and in my lifetime, I will become a billionaire. It's, it's crazy. I just got to grow at 12%. If I grow my current net worth for the next 40 something years at 12%, 13%, I'll be a billionaire. 12% is not hard. My current portfolio is growing at 25% with leverage in real estate. And when you buy businesses, you guys talk about the EBITDA model. I don't ever want to pay. I ideally don't want to pay more than three times true EBITDA, which means I'm looking at a 33% return on my money when I buy a business. 33%. That's before leverage. You can leverage businesses. People didn't know this. You can go borrow from the bank, a prime plus two, 75% loan to value, and buy a big business. It has to be a big, stable business. They're not going to loan on like a little small mom and pop shop. But you can go to the bank and borrow to buy businesses. So if you do, you go and, and by the way, jump in the comments. If you're liking this, style of the wise wall show it's the first time we're trying it you know i saw this money getting this fancy whiteboard floor to ceiling I guess can't, can't even if i write on the bottom you don't even see it anyway so but uh let me know if you like this if you're enjoying this style of of teaching if you're enjoying you know jump the questions in there and, and kyle will read them to me if i can't i can probably still see them from here but anyway that's sort of what we look for but when i lever up with businesses i go borrow from the bank say 65 percent loan to value it's pretty standard um which means the bank puts up 65 cents, I put up 35 cents of every dollar. Um, hey, welcome on, good to see you on. Life Orion, good to see you on. Keith, I'm in class and love learning, that's awesome. Uh, good to see you on, Keith. I feel like I'm in finance class all over again, Professor Rosehart. I actually am, I actually do do a guest, guest lecture at the Richard Ivey School of Business. They wrote a case called the Rosehart's, part A, part B, for the wealth management class. So I talk about RFPs, TFSAs, um, a lot of the you know insurance products and how all that works. I'm not a big fan of insurance actually overall, but I explain all of basically what I used to do as a financial planner in that class. And we talk about how to build a financial plan, which most financial plans are like 30, 40 pages and a ton of it accompanying documents. So that's what that case is about. I have a lot of fun doing it. They're really smart kids. So this gives my chance to do this on YouTube. And you guys get to watch. The cool thing is this is replayable. So you can watch this a million times. If you didn't get it the first time, rewind and watch it again and again and again. And if you watch this again, you just heard me say it again nine times. Okay, so 65% loan to value, LTV. That's what you can borrow against the business. So I go to the bank. I say I got a half a million bucks in earnings. I'll personally guarantee the loan uh, against the corporation. But the corporation can borrow itself because the corporation has solid EBITDA, earnings before income taxes and depreciation and amortization. So if a business has strong cash flow and strong profitability, you can bring that business to a bank and borrow against it. So you go borrow against the business, 65%, you put in 35%. You could also get really smart, which is what I, I like to do every time when I buy a business is a vendor take back. You can structure it through a promissory note, so you can structure it as debt. You could also structure it as a creative equity solution, where basically they put up, I mean, I've seen solutions, this happens all the time. You get a 35% vendor take back and 65% from the bank. So you can buy a business with zero euro money down, none. You can buy like a five million in sales business that's generating 500,000 a year in annual cash flow and then 10X that business, right? If it's not very efficient. So you can go borrow a vendor take back 
Most owners of small businesses have been doing these businesses, they've been in their families, or they've been doing this business for 10, 20, 30 years. Their biggest fear, most of these people are successful, they're fairly wealthy because they've built these businesses and ran them for long periods of time. Their biggest fear is their baby. You know, they call their business their baby. Their baby going into the wrong hands. So it's more about convincing them that you're gonna take good care of their business, help build their brand, grow their business. A lot of them wanna stay on in a part-time capacity. Maybe they wanna retire, they just want out. In a lot of situations, look for a distressed seller. So someone who wants to retire, someone who's tired of the business, maybe they're going through a divorce, maybe something happened in the family, whatever. Maybe, you know, the, the dad died, the two kids are fighting over who's gonna run the business, so they just sell it all together. Um, really quite interesting, I think, at the end of the day, when you look at buying businesses. I've been, you know, not actively talking about it until now. Um, but let's talk about it. Let's, do, let's use this video to talk about it. So you structure your vendor take back with the business. So they, they basically, you'll give them 65% up front when you buy the business. You'll purchase the business. You'll purchase the shares of the business in most cases. There are two ways to buy a business. You can buy all their assets and that's it and then set up a new corp. Or you can buy the entire corp and assume all liabilities, unfortunately, that the corp has. In some cases, you have to do that because the business might own real estate. It may own vehicles. It may own, and there may be debts against those assets. So there might not be a way to structure it where you can just you know, buy, the, buy the assets. But ideally, you buy the assets of the business. You can also buy the, the shares of the business, very common way to do it. When you do that, you effectively, the, the business owner who's selling the business will set up a promissory note or a vendor take back type situation. And over, you know, usually it's a really short amortization, unfortunately, you know, it's like a two to five year amortization type thing where the business owner will guarantee certain sales targets. So there'll be covenants on this vendor take back loan that you're paying them back over three years or four years or five years, but they only get paid back if they maintain certain sales targets. That gives me, the buyer, a really good confidence in the business because the owner's gonna guarantee 35% of the value that the sales targets will continue to be you know, within 95% of current sales. So that, that guarantees when the owner leaves, I don't have sales just drop off because all the relationships were with that owner. That happens a lot, by the way, in businesses. The owner leaves and two of their key staff leave too or you know, um, two of their, their key accounts that buy the product are like, oh, the owner's no longer here. I don't wanna deal with you. And so that sort of insulates and protects you against that. So I'm a very big fan of you if you have the cash to structure a better take back of at least 10%. Every business I buy, I want a better take back. Almost every business. There are some businesses where relationships don't matter in the sales process where I might consider just buying 100% of the assets. Or in a fire sale, again, if I'm getting a really good deal on the equipment and I'm buying below equipment cost, that could be a situation where, again, I would be okay to not accept a better take back. But it depends on the deal. Better take backs, really, really important. Um, I think overall for, for just buying it. So in this example, right, you, you've bought 35% from the vendor, you gotta pay them back over a three year period, and you get 65% from the bank at like six or 7%, most likely. And the vendor's probably gonna give you like 5%. They'll lend you cheap. Because most people, you know, most of these old guys who are retiring or whatever, they think 5% return on their money is great. So they're usually happy lending around that range. Now, if you did this situation, let, let's go more conservative. Let's say the, the guy only got you 25% better take back and 10% you had to put up. So owner, like new owner. New owner puts up 10%, guys. App Factory, good to see you on. Labodal, without any experience running a business, I'm guessing you would start with something on your own before attempting this. Yeah, so you'd wanna make sure that you have, often I'll partner. So if I have a friend I know that's really good in like the, the paper business, let's say we're buying, since there's a sheet of paper on my floor here, let's say we're buying the paper business, and I knew a guy who got a manufacturer paper, it'd be a strategic buy. So I would buy it and put him in charge to run the company. And we would have some sort of strategic play. If I have no way to add value to the company, like I'm just buying a business for the cash flow, that's just that's not my model. But some wealthy people do do that. I'm more of the Buffett style, more of the value investor, where I'll buy and unlock value. So I'll say that they're super inefficient how they currently do their process. Maybe they're maybe they're making the paper themselves in their own warehouse. And I'm like, geez, I can go to China and buy this paper for like two cents a sheet and they're paying eight cents a sheet. And if I could do that and maintain the same quality, I can boost profit by like 600%. That's an easy example of going in and adding some real value. Um, you'd want to have some industry experience, but you can learn that. Most of the business owners will train you. They'll stay on for six months, a year, and provide training and support. So if you're looking for sort of a, something to do in your retirement, maybe this is it. Um, yeah, so that, that, that's a real example of a real business I looked at buying. 65% from the bank, 25% from the lender, right? We're at 90%, and then I just, you might have to put up 10% of the money. So you buy a million dollar business, let's look at a real example. Let's say you buy a million dollar business. 
and the bank put up 650k. The owner put up 250k of the value, and you had to put up $100,000 to buy a million dollar business. Very common, you put up $100,000 to buy a million dollar business, right? How did you get the value of a million? Well, I want to see a good earnings before income taxes and depreciation. You might have an income statement over here that's showing, I don't know, 350,000 in net income, NI, net income. But you gotta get to EBITDA, so earnings before depreciation taxes. Maybe there's like 20,000 in equipment depreciation that you add back. Maybe there's like some random loan he made to his family member he's gonna pay off when he sells it to you. So you add back 10,000 interest for that on the balance. Uh, on the income statement. You're going to try and normalize the income to what would happen if the owner no longer owned the business. So what would happen if you bought the business? Well, if you bought the business, you're not going to pay his crazy cousin, Jerry, $10,000. You're not going to pay out um, any normalization. So let's say the owner's paying himself $150,000 a year. Then you might say, you know what? Market value for their position, you know, maybe they just do, they're an operator, and maybe you could replace them for $75,000. So they're making hundred and fifty right now on the books. I'm going to adjust the EBITDA for the difference between what it would cost me to replace that key staff member. So I would say, okay, owner's not gonna be in the business anymore, so we're not gonna have $150,000 in expense, but I'm not gonna put someone in there to do their role. So we're gonna have to have, and basically, plus $75,000 um, added to the, to the overall. And maybe there's some, some things you can subtract too, but let's just say we just did this right now, we're at, was that, $95,000? Let's just go another $5,000 or something else, a miscellaneous um, line item. I don't know what it would be. Just think of some miscellaneous line item added in there. Call it, uh, maybe the owner currently pays his, pays his best friend Jimmy a $5,000 salary, and you're like, you know what, like that, there's no reason to pay that guy $5,000. He does nothing but like smile once a year at a company function. So just add that back too. And there, now you've got the actual EBITDA. So you've got 30,000, well, let's just say it's 100,000. I, I did the math wrong here, but. I thought that was a, I thought that was a one, so 10,000, 10,000. 5,000 is 25,000 plus 75 is, is 100,000. So 100K total, and then plus 350 is 450K. Okay. So let's say we came to an earnings um, EBITDA of like 2 point, whatever that is, 2 million, 2.2 or something. So you might say, I'm going to pay an EBITDA of 2.2. He's at this valuation of a million. You might say, I only want to pay an EBITDA of 2. So you might offer him a million dollar business. I don't know. You might offer 900000 Maybe at the end of the day, you decide there's a way to add some value to the business. You paid a million bucks. You paid him 2.2 EBITDA because you go and look at some comparable businesses that I've sold. And you're like, you know what? I'm 450 k normalized income. I'm going to get my money back in like two years. So my ROI is like 40, 50%. Um, so anyway, let's just assume that you bought it for a million for easy math. So 650 from the bank. 250000 is from the vendor take back. He's probably structured this as a loan with covenants that he doesn't get paid his, like he forgoes this money entirely if the sales targets aren't met. So if sales drop off 30% when the owner leaves because he has some key relationships that led to the sales, you get to keep like a portion of that money. So you get a discount on the purchase price, basically. Um, that's how they're take back work. So that's a great way to ensure that a year from now you don't get screwed buying a business. And then you put up your, this is you. You put up this capital. Your ROI, let's say, let's say I get there. Let's say somehow I get to squeak the income plus 150K for easy math. And then we have 500K here. A little bit easier math here, just so you guys can follow. Let's say he's paying his cousin Jimmy 50K to smile at company events. He liked his cousin Jimmy, you know, whatever his reason was. So we got 150K here. So we got 500, we got 350,000 of net income plus adjustments to EBITDA, you know, for depreciation and interest and, you know, his salary and his cousin Jimmy. You've got 500,000 in earnings before income, depreciation and taxes. So this $500,000 here, by the way, I didn't prep at all for this. It's just like, literally, I'm just doing this off the cuff, just making this example up. Didn't even know I was gonna do an example like this, but we'll just go with it. So let's say it was a two, two multiple of, of EBITDA. So you have this 500,000, you got a two multiple, so times two gives you your value of the company. So your value of the company is an adjusted up earnings of 500,000, so your multiples two means your evaluation's a million bucks. So that we agree on that, you know, we have some back and forth. Maybe he's listed the company for 1.5, we get him down to a million bucks. We go through the numbers, I explain where, where I'm coming from. That return on your investment is 50%. 50% return on investment. Industry standard's about 30. If I'm buying a business in Canada, I want about a 30% return. Pre-leverage, before leverage. 
Um, I guess there are many questions coming in here. We've got to answer. I'm going to try to scroll up here and see if I can read those. Hey, good to see some, some regulars jumping in here. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so the first question um, is without any experience running a business, I'm guessing you would start something on your own before attempting this. Yeah, I mean, I kind of answered that question a little bit before, I think. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that, again, comes down to your personal fit. Like, do you feel like you'd be comfortable running this business? I have a business degree, so I would, ask, I would be a strategic partner. I'd be less of an operating partner and more of a strategic one. But when you're buying businesses, even if you aren't adding any value, you're, let's, let's assume you could add no value to this business and just kept operating the exact same as it was. You put your, you put your brother, Ricky, in charge of the company. Ricky knows how to sell paper. Ricky doesn't do any better job than the previous owner. The company just runs in, in flat mode. You're still looking at 30% return, but I haven't even got to leverage yet. Wait, because you borrowed 65% loan to value from the bank and 25% from the vendor. You've only put up 100 grand. So you're getting a net income before, you know, obviously before the interest cost of these two debts, right? There's going to be interest associated with these two debts. But you're looking at 500000 less interest. Whatever the interest is in these two debts, less interest, call it carrying cost to borrow that money, equals your return. I bet you on six hundred fifty grand, you are looking at like 25000 in interest payments. And on this one, you're probably looking at like, I don't know, 10000 in interest payments, roughly. So you're going to lose about $45,000. So it'll be 500000 you guys can still see this, minus, yeah, it's still on camera, cool. 500,000 minus 45,000 in interest costs to pay the interest on these two debts, right? Leaves you with a net income adjusted of 455,000. Now to make 455 grand on your $100,000 down payment to buy the business, that's a good return. That's 400% return on your money, net of cost of debt. That's the kind of stuff I'm going to start getting into. I'm looking, actually, I'm in talks right now with two businesses to buy that are bigger than this. Um, so I want to kind of share some of that with you. I'm thinking about maybe a few of my core YouTubers have reached out, like YouTube subscribers and friends, and said, man, like, I would love to get involved in that. Like, could I, you know, for instance, lend you some money to buy these businesses or something like that? So this could be, when I say you, this could be you, because I'm, I'm working and networking and finding businesses like this. This could be you that's getting a great return. And I'm in this with real estate now already. It's a very similar process, um, buying businesses versus buying real estate. It's just businesses are, again, inherently more risky. And so you have inherently with higher risk, higher return. Oh, shoot, drop it. Ah, back on camera. Um, so you get your 30% or 50% return, and then with leverage, you're at like 400% return, right? Your 100,000 down payment, over 455,000 net income, let, Less debt. Oh, sorry, the other way around. My bad. 455k. I'm doing the return on investment ROI formula equals net income divided by net payment. You got 455 percent, roughly. Um, let's get some of these questions banged out here. Having a business is the only way to get rich. Uh, factory, great observation. It isn't necessarily the only way. Real estate is actually the fastest way to get to a million or two million net worth. It gets really hard with real estate to grow to 10 or 100 or 500 million. Like, could you imagine trying to lever up and deploy $100 million in London, Ontario? Like, lever it up, that would be like 400 million in real estate. So it'd be, that's a lot of, to buy, but you can go buy businesses really easily. Um, these are private businesses, by the way. You can go buy public shares in companies. But there isn't any arbitrage, and so the risk isn't near as um, high, and so the returns are not near as good. I'm talking about buying private businesses and flipping those businesses. So what I would do is not only have this business for like two years, but I want to stabilize earnings for two years. So when you flip a business like this one, I'm going to drive, I'm going to drive sales up a million bucks, let's say. I'm going to put, put in someone, let's say I know someone in the industry, I hire the best sales guy, he starts selling this paper. I go myself and start making cold calls, right? That's where I'm going to add value. I'll go and cold call a bunch of people who want to buy paper. I say, where are you buying paper now? Print shops, like we're buying it from like Staples. I'm like, look, I'll beat the price. And I guess paper's a bad example because it's a commodity. But um, I, I guess I'd have to pr prove my paper somehow better. Like my paper's like twice as thick. It's going to make your printer last longer, whatever. Let's just say I actually had a product like that. Then I could sell my paper to this print shop, as an example, and bring another $50,000 in revenue. Something to that effect. And so I drive revenue way up and I drive my net income up to say 750,000. 
And the interesting thing is when a business breaks a million in sales and breaks a million in, in EBITDA, the multiple gets better. It gets better. The bigger the business gets, the more stable it is and the better the multiple. So a small business might trade at like a two multiple and an established business might trade at a five multiple. So as you get bigger and grow EBITDA, you grow value, but you also grow the multiple. So at 750,000, let's say I get it to a million bucks. Let's say I get or EBITDA double, you know, it's around 500,000. I grow it to a million. I get, I drive costs down and I bring sales way up. So my sales go up 700,000, my costs go down 300,000. That's net a million bucks to my bottom line, right? Revenue just went up 700,000. My cost went down as a percentage, three, you know, 300,000 or whatever. Boom, there I got an extra million bucks, a million bucks in EBITDA. I go and sell, a million bucks in EBITDA, I probably could sell this business at a three and a half multiple. Good to see you guys on, good to see you on CEB. Um, oh, some good questions here, I'm excited to get to these. So you got your million bucks, right? And a three and a half multiple now, because this business is bigger and more stable, and the owner doesn't run any operations at all. I, I'd be the new owner, let's say hypothetically, maybe I have two business partners, we say, look, we have all key general manager in place, key operational staff. This is a turnkey business. That's way more valuable than the pitch saying, hey, person with capital, do you want to invest and run this business? Most people with the money to buy the businesses, they don't want to run the businesses. They just want to invest in them. So you make the business saleable. Same way I buy a rental property that's distressed, bad tenants in rough condition. I would buy a property like a business. Business that's got rough, bad expenses, bad employees, bad systems. You know, bad sales process, and I improve the systems. I improve how they store their inventory, how they buy their, their stuff, how they train their staff, to be, I'll make their staff more efficient. All these things, you, you go line by line and you find the weaknesses in the business and you make it better. Same as in real estate, when I buy a property and I take that property that's distressed, I kick the bad tenants out, I renovate it, make it really nice, stabilize it, insulate it so that the utilities go way down. I normalize the utilities, I normalize the expenses, and then I take that property back to an appraiser, get a value on it, take it back to market and sell it. It's how you flip the property. When you flip the business, same sort of thing. So now this business, million bucks in EBITDA, I doubled, I doubled the earnings. So I bought it, had 500,000 in income, I get it up to a million bucks. And now it's worth three and a half times EBITDA because it's, again, like I said, the more stable the business is, the more valuable it is. The bigger the business is, the more valuable it is. It's weird how that goes, but literally the bigger you build the business, the better the multiple. So not only is, is it gonna trade at, you know, if it was trading at two times, earnings, it'd be worth two million bucks. I paid a million bucks for it, but no, it's worth three and a half times. So it's worth three and a half million bucks. Best case scenario. So now I'm gonna sell this business for three and a half million bucks. I'm gonna retain 10% or 20% of ownership of the company and sell 80% of it off, something to that effect. But I just made two and a half million dollars flipping a business over a year or two and stabilizing the income statements. That's what I wanna get into in a big way. I'm really excited about this, guys. I've been doing this since business school and I have a lot of the skills needed, I just didn't have the capital, and I didn't have the network to buy these businesses, and now I'm starting to network with the right people to find businesses. So doing videos like this, where maybe people wanna sell their, they reach out and they say, hey Mike, like, I saw your YouTube video, uh, it was way over my head from the financing perspective, but I would love to buy, I'd love if you wanted to buy my business, or be a partner in my business, or help me improve my business, and I'd be open to partnerships too, if someone came to me with a business, they needed some help, I'd be happy to be a strategic partner, and help them improve the business. That's what it's all about. That's how you flip businesses. And you make a ton of money. You put $100,000 in capital in that example. Maybe you pay off the better take back over two, three years with the business. right? So you, you pay back these two loans with the cash flow from the business over the two years you were stabilizing it before you were preparing to sell it. And it does take time. But you can't flip a business quickly. You can flip a property quick in like 60, 90 days. You can't flip a business quick. It takes a year or two. They need solid financials that have been updated. Jeez, um, Kyle. Um, so yeah, it just takes a little bit longer to flip a business, but the ROI can be really fantastic. You can make a thousand percent, two thousand percent, five thousand percent return on your investment. And that's some of my skills we utilize and have a little bit of fun doing it at the same time. Now it's Q and A time. Okay. Let's go down here and see what's good. Sorry if I'm in the way of the screen there, if it helps. Okay. Let's go up here. Can't tell the difference if it's off or on. Love this style, switch it up. Everyone gives it a thumbs up. Pooh cool. Um, having a business is the only way to get rich. Definitely a decent observation. I don't think it's the only way, but it's, it is a way. Real estate is probably a primary way. Great info for someone like me, working in my family business, so either if we end up selling or buying another company, this is key. Life of Brian, um, great point. I really should title this video, um, how, to buy, how to flip businesses, because that would get 
probably more views, but it's a shame because today is the, the 42nd episode. Dunder Mifflin. I don't even know what that even means. Uh, isn't that like a tire company or something? Yeah. Is buying a franchise good or is it not worth it? Um, it depends. I think franchise is overpriced. You don't have as good of a sale um, down the road. You pay a lot in royalties and franchise fees to get the setup. Nothing wrong with like a good franchise. Like I like to buy a uh, Subway and a Tim Hortons and a McDonald's at different various points. And the Subway concept was pretty interesting and the Tim Hortons as well, very interesting. If you can lock down a good location, that's the key because um, they give you all the systems to run it. The problem is guys like Tim Hortons, those brands, they require you to um, be active. You have to commit that you're gonna be active at the business every single day. So you can't hire a manager to run the Tim Hortons. They don't allow it, it's just not allowed because they have certain quality standards. So that wouldn't work for me. I wouldn't want to be in the Tim Hortons every day as a general manager. I'd rather hire a general manager and train them than physically be in a location. So sort of my thoughts on it. Um, franchises can be good, just depends. If you had to start all over in real estate, how would you go about getting to 5K income a month? Mike, good question. Um, I don't want to really delete all this yet, but let's run through some real examples. This is a good one. Spend a minute or two on this one. Actually, I'm gonna come back to this one. I'm gonna get some questions answered and then I'll come back to that example in a second. I'm gonna run a mini Rose Heart Snowball. So basically five properties, even three. Uh, let's do five. I like five properties better. We'll do an example of, in a minute, we're gonna do an example of how to buy five properties to produce 5,000 a month in income. You can do that for like a couple hundred thousand in capital. So it's relatively easy. Okay. Um, these big loans get really scary, bro. It's good to do this young. So if you fail and go bankrupt, it won't hurt you for life. Bankruptcy only lasts seven years. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, you have to be very careful when you're buying businesses. When you buy real estate, it's safe, right? Like I buy a property for 200 grand that's worth 300. No matter what I do to it, I'm gonna be able to get my money back because I bought smart. The same is true in businesses. So if I know this business brings in 500,000 in income, I know I need to be able to sell it for like, I know, like, like when I buy a business, I'm gonna make sure that I can get my money back in like one to two years. That's sort of my, my ideal metric. Um, that, that's sort of the play I go with and then I can always, always sell the business. You're right, buying businesses, inherently riskier. There's no doubt about that. I, I, won't, I won't try to pretend that real estate is on the same risk level as buying businesses. The rewards are way higher buying businesses because the risk is higher. Good observation, great point, love it. Uh, at Factory Life of Ryan says, you would make the purchase through another corporation limiting personal liability. This is true. If they don't, if the bank doesn't make you personally guarantee, you, you could buy it through a corp and limit your downside 100%. You'd potentially walk away from your capital. That's about it. You could have to personally guarantee some of the loans to get a good interest rate, in which case then they would come down like the hammer on you personally. At Factory says, wait, so you're telling me to bank Declare bankruptcy on the corporation at one of my personal credit. Uh, yeah, more or less. Yeah, I mean, it's some. Um, the problem is this like, the banks are smart, and most of them realize that you could probably do that with the vendor take back part of it. That part of the capital you could probably abandon and nothing they could do. Um, but the banks are smart now, they want personal guarantees. So at the end of the day, that's they're going to say, look, Mike, guarantee your personal net worth against this loan. So if the business fails, they're going to come back on me. That's just the nature of it, unfortunately. That's why, that's a barrier to entry. The ultra wealthy that I pointed out before, the guys who are making, hey Hugo, good to see you on. Um, the guys who are making a couple hundred thousand, um, you know, a year income personally, and they've got net worth of a few million, those people can easily leverage. Someone who's got no money, it's gonna be hard for you to, if you're like 18 years old and you've got no experience, it's gonna be hard for you to go in and make this pitch to borrow this money. That's why like I, I'd probably can open something up to the YouTube fans, to and the, just friends of my network, to lend money to me, and I'll go take the money and lever it up, um, basically, right? So you could lend it to me and get a guaranteed return, something like that. Like I, I I'm considering honestly, if someone to lend between five and ten percent, I'd probably take your money and pay you a five or ten percent guaranteed return monthly, personally guaranteed against my own net worth and the properties that I own, and go and buy properties and flip them. It's you know I can make like fifty percent return flipping, so. It makes no, it's, it's super simple for me to, between 20 and 50%. So I can make a good spread on people's money who are lending to me and it's, 
completely hassle free and easy for the people learning. So, okay, I'm gonna go up here and if that's the case, why doesn't everyone just start a business that's virtually low risk? Um, yeah, I mean, that's why it's hard to get money in a corporation that doesn't have stable uh, revenue and earnings. So if you start a brand new business, no bank's gonna lend you any money in that corp. Because they're like, what guarantees do we have? You're gonna pay us back. So yeah, a business like this could borrow money because it's got 500,000 a year in income. So you go to a bank with that, a stable business that's been around 10, 20 years with 500,000 in income, the bank will lend against that. That's stable, that's secure. There's a good chance that income's gonna continue to to move forward. So when you're buying an established business, you're buying the business's credit, you're buying the business's history. So that's the nice thing about buying established businesses is then I can get five of these in a portfolio together and say, hey, I've got five businesses generating 10 million in sales, go to a bank and go borrow five, 10 million against my portfolio of businesses that I own. So this is something I'm looking at to, to blow my net worth. I'm just having fun with it, to be honest with you. Like this is like, I'm in my element doing this kind of stuff all day, right? Okay, let's go up here and catch up. Uh, probably the case, Ryan, how else could Trump declare bankruptcy multiple times? Yeah, so that's exactly how Trump declared bankruptcy. A lot of his corporations got in debt over their head because they were stable businesses. They were able to borrow a lot of money and then they basically declared bankruptcy. The nice thing is he kept those shell corporations open and all of the tax losses got to carry forward to future years. And he put income back in those corps and pays no tax. So that's, and same on the personal side, you can do the same thing called uh, capital gains, loss, carry forwards. It's great. Um, I had a loss, I bought some shares in a company earlier last year that had a huge loss. A friend of mine recommended me buy this company and I did the analysis and it just didn't go the way we thought it would. And I lost about 20 something thousand dollars on these shares that I bought, publicly traded shares. I'm gonna take that loss and offset it against a couple properties that I sold last year. So I'm only really losing half because my tax rate's so high. That's an advantage of, of loss and you can, you can actually buy companies. That's another interesting concept is when you buy companies that have huge losses, like tax losses that you can carry forward. You can buy an empty shell corp that's near bankruptcy, right? You don't bankrupt because you got like 200,000 in losses there. And I'll buy that company at you know 20% of the value of the, or 30% of the value of the tax losses and then put my, my income in that corp. And then for the next two years, I can get basically no tax in that corp because that corp has a big losses you can carry forward. So there's, it's called like, there's like tax loss harvesting and um, yeah, basically you just buy businesses that have huge tax losses. It's a great, great way to make some money. Many people do and have been burnt before, 100%. Now we ask for 50% cash up front for jobs we do and balance on completion, 100%. Yeah, Life Ryan, it's a, it's a great point. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a fine line, I think, at the end of the day to, to ask for 50% up front. I don't know what you do for the business, but I don't, like to pay, I don't pay my contractors 50% up front. I will pay the materials, like I'll, you know, I'll pay the materials. If they, that's one thing I'm building a relationship with a new contractor. I'll say I'll pay all the materials and they're just up to labor. But yeah, you, you take a risk in business. Businesses go bankrupt every day. It happens all the time. Uh, what industry are you looking at? Restaurants? No, I'm not looking at restaurants. I'm looking at um, more established. I like established businesses like distribution, manufacturing, um, stable stuff. Like I don't like tech to be honest with you. Cause I, it's hard if you have an app, that's, you know, nothing's proprietary. Someone else could just make the exact same app and then beat you to market or do it, do it better than you 1% better. And your business is obsolete. If you're selling like paper or markers, right? Like that's a solid business. You have $2 million in sales and good relationships with a lot of people. You're buying those relationships when you buy that business, with those you know, suppliers that buy the paper. So that's the kind of business I like is more commodity style or you know, a more stable product is, is my preferred choice. I like to buy businesses like tech businesses and tech companies sell based on future earnings, future potential. I like to buy businesses that trade on current cash flows. It's just who I am. It's the reason I don't buy Bitcoin because I don't believe in things that don't cash flow. I like to buy cash flowing businesses the same way I like to buy cash flowing properties. Good points. Okay, uh, next question is, what industries, I, I mentioned that a little bit, uh, don't want to say restaurants. Yeah, restaurants are not a big one. It's a really competitive environment. It's hard to stay hip and stay you know, trending and like a, one bad hire, the results like some food poisoning or a bad shipment of food can really screw you over with the health inspector here in Ontario. 
So I would just stay away from restaurants for the most part, unless it's like a big time franchise, then I might be interested in a really good deal on say, you know, Subway or Tim Hortons, maybe. If, if I didn't have to be a daily operator. I used to work at Tim Hortons for two years, so no, no way I'm crawling back to my 16 year old job. <laughs> good to see you on CB. Man, getting burnt ain't that bad. It's not like you became a slave like in Roman times. Yeah, I mean, it could always be worse, but it still sucks getting burned, right? Any other multiples you look at? Yeah, so there's a lot of different multiples you can, like he hasn't been to business school, you can see there's lots of different ways, but most of these entrepreneurs that I'm buying these businesses from are not sophisticated. So what that means is they know basically net income and their accountant doctors up net income. They don't even understand the financial statements. So a lot of these business owners, unfortunately, like some really successful business owners have 10 million net worth, don't know how to do an income statement or a balance sheet. And so that's where I get a little bit of an edge on these people because I have that finance background. They hire their accountant and rely on their accountant to do everything for them. That's honestly the truth in most of these businesses. So that's, that's the nature of things um, in that regard. I like, I like EBITDA. Um, I've seen revenue in businesses before, especially businesses that are not profitable. You see them trade on revenue, one times revenue, two times revenue. I like two to five, again, on, on EBITDA. I prefer two to three on EBITDA. You know, if it's a really stable business and there's some really good upside, I might invest in, you know, four times EBITDA. Yeah, that's, those are the main ratios that I look at. You can, when EBITDA doesn't make sense is if you have a business that's declining. So you have a business that's losing money, it's not profitable because it needs to be optimized. Let's say the cost is out of control. The owner doesn't know how to buy paper properly. He's manufacturing his own paper. And uh, Andrew, good to see you on. Thanks, appreciate that. Um, it's, it's one of those things in that case where you look at the balance sheet. Instead of the income statement where the, where the EBITDA, the income sits and then the EBITDA you adjust to, you instead look at the balance sheet and go to the balance sheet and say, what are the assets worth minus all the debts of the company? So maybe they have a million bucks in machinery. There's some depreciation on that machinery. Market value of the machinery is like above a thousand and say they got some debt of another hundred thousand. So you've got 400,000 net value of the assets at market value. So I might offer, you know, half of that. I might offer half of market value of their machinery, which if I just bought like a factory with a million bucks in machinery for like $200,000. In that case, I feel pretty safe because I'm buying the assets at below market value cost. And so even if I don't make any sales, even if I can't turn things around, I bought the assets for less than what they're selling for. Inventory is a big one too. Companies might like be a paper company, might have a million bucks in paper in their warehouse and whatever. And paper is a bad example. Like, like pick something else, pick like pens, like pens in their warehouse. And you buy their inventory for like 20 cents on the dollar. That's an example where you buy on a multiple of, in, of market value of inventory. You might buy at a 50% 50 of market value of their inventory. And you might just really buy the business for the inventory. And then what would be cool is you find a second business and you get synergies. So synergies is where you combine two businesses and there's some cost savings. So maybe you have one business that gets really good cost on markers. So you buy that business, buy all their materials. They sucked at selling their markers though. So they were like, they had huge losses. They had no earnings on their balance sheet or their income statement. And their balance sheet just literally had the inventory on it and a bunch of debt. So you give them like a fire sale, you buy their, their markers for super cheap. Then you buy another company that's really good at selling, but has a terrible, you know, one of them's like, maybe they have a really good cost base on their markers. And so you combine the two, you know, the business that was good at selling the markers and the business that was good at getting markers cheap, you merge the two companies together into one, you buy them each at a discount and you get some synergies. Maybe you only need one accountant instead of two separate accountants when you combine the businesses together. So you can lay some people off or whatever, get more efficient. That's a really cool mergers and acquisitions conversation. Took a whole class on, on those types of businesses. But there are a lot of things you can do in the business world that's really interesting with buying and selling businesses. It's something I have a passion for. I want to fund some young entrepreneurs, people who have like the work ethic that I did that I do and, and did when I was 19. I would I would love to fund those people starting businesses. So at some point I think I'll become like a private equity guy where I'll just like an angel investor and jump in these companies and provide strategic direction. I'm actually looking at getting on to be a judge for the um, the IV case comps, the IV entrepreneurial um, businesses. Because a lot of those kids get jobs out of school and they have these great business ideas and one of them could take that business and run if they have the capital. And I might be that guy that helps seed young entrepreneurs and in the process, make a bunch of money. So that's something I'm interested in. Um, great question, great questions. Um, so after Austin's question about Mark um, multiples, Eric says, this is some great info. Love the diversity of the financial knowledge you're covering. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate that. 
Smash that like button, guys. We got 11 likes and 23 people in the in the chat. Dunder Muffin is a fictional paper company from the TV show The Office. Uh, okay, so that was lost on me. <laughs> I need to watch The Office at some point. I've watched like one or two stray episodes. Um, hey, Mike, great job and everything. Thanks. Dang, I missed a lot of the math here. What's up? So Trevor, you'll have to catch the, the replay there. I'm just talking about how you value businesses that are super high level. Uh, I promised Mike that I'd do an example about how to buy properties, so hang in for that. We'll do that real quick. Okay. We're in the print and display manufacturing industry. Cool. I've been looking at like the billboard industry and some other cool industries too. Been in the GDA for almost 40 years before my time. Life of Ryan, that's cool, man. You have to give me some more details on your business. Send me a DM. I'd love to hear about it. Maybe we can do like a video segment on your business or something cool. I think the viewers would like that. Comps are probably not possible to value a business. Do you create a DCF? So DCF is a discounted cash flow statement or is solely based just on multiples of current company sales and other metrics. So I always do a cash flow statement when I'm buying a business. So people who don't, like just people watching this who have no financial background at all, it's basically your income statement, your balance sheet, and your cash flow statement is effectively um, what is actually happening in your business. The reason cash flow statements are important is you might have an income statement. The best example is you might have an income statement with 500,000 in EBITDA, and then you go look month to month, you do DCF, discounted cash flow statement, or you do a month to month cash budget, and you see in like April, they buy a bunch of inventory and they have no sales, and then they sell, maybe they sell in September, like all their paper, it's like all these schools or something. And so they've got a huge cash burn. They're like negative a million bucks in cash. And then they have a huge influx, they sell all their paper in September. And all of a sudden, boom, they get like two million bucks in cash in. And so you wouldn't see by looking at the income statement or the balance sheet, you'd have no idea without looking at the cash flow statement, that they make all of their revenue in 60 days of the year, right in like August, September. And maybe they have costs all, all year long. And so to survive from October all the way again to the following August, they have a cash burn of a million and a half bucks. You need to have a ton of working capital in the company or a huge line of credit or something to that effect. People don't think about that, that you have businesses that potentially are losing money for 10 months straight and then have a huge windfall. And then that's just like, that's the seasonality. A lot of businesses are like that. Um, that would be, I would always do a cash flow analysis. I would always look at that when I buy a business and I'd bring that to the owner and be like, hey, you didn't disclose, you say you're making 500,000 a year, but look, for six months a year, you're burning 200 grand a month more than you're selling. Like you're, it's costing you 200 grand more a month to operate. That's scary, right? Think of the seasonal businesses like ice cream businesses and water parks and stuff like that. They often have burn, huge burn cycles and then they have earn cycles for like a four or five month period. So they have to carry with their profit from the four months for the remaining eight months. A lot of businesses like that with seasonality and just the nature of business. Some months are slow and there's a burn in a month or two where you got to fund that. And so that's where like, you know, discounted cash flow is a bit, I've done DCFs, but the problem is you bring that to the, the entrepreneur who is like a 60 year old dude who has been running his business for like 25 years. He refers, defers everything to his account. He doesn't even understand an income statement. So you bring him a DCF and he's like, uh, what do I do with this? That's the that's what I've realized is, is the reality in the small business space. I say small business, meaning like any business less than $10 million valuation. When you get into like iBanking or like a large private equity seg sectors with big businesses, then you do DCFs, right, of course. Um, but most people who are looking to buy smaller businesses privately won't be doing DCFs. It's just what, what I've found. I mean, I still do one, it's, it's still helpful. Um, great question though, great question. Um, solely multiple based, yeah, so. There, there's some other metrics, like I said, that you can use as well. It depends on the business. I'm just thinking of like the three businesses that I'm valuating right now. There probably is some other valuation techniques and models that you can use. Like we learned about a bunch of them in finance class, like you do football fields and stuff like that. Comps, yeah, comps are tough. Like it's hard to get comps to businesses that have sold. So you, you usually get like an industry um, metric, like pest control might be like one to two times sales. And that's like just the way that they operate. Um, it just depends, like you, you can go find out what the industry metrics are. Where can I learn how to renovate a home? I know this is a pretty vague question, but there was a book or something in particular that I can, so How to Save, um, great name by the way, you're gonna love the video coming out where I give all the frugal hacks that I use to live on like 24 grand a year. Um, so take tuned for that video, but how do you learn how to renovate a house? YouTube, YouTube is the best. I did some old videos a while back where I showed that you know what, I think I'm gonna, that'd be a cool video to do. Maybe I should do a video inside a house with like two by fours, 
put it against the concrete wall and show you how you put tar paper out, and then you have to put the two by four. And you don't touch it to the concrete because that's against code violation. And you know maybe then you put insulation in, and then you put your your vapor barrier and you tuck tape it. Maybe there'd be value in that. But it's probably already on YouTube. You could literally just YouTube like how to frame a wall, how to drywall the wall, how to tape like basically mud and tape, how to mud and tape a wall, how to use drywall compounds to create the seams, how to paint, how to cut and install trim, how to, well you'd lay the floor first, so like you paint and then you'd lay the floor and then you put the, the trim on. The reason you do it that way, some people put the trim on before they put the floors on, they put the, they put the floor up to the wall, they put the trim down and they take the floor away and then when they do lay the floor at the end they know exactly like it'll fit right underneath the trim. They do that because then they can spray the, the trim with paint and then paint the walls. The reason you do the floors last, because otherwise you get paint driplets on your floor. So ideally you don't want to have to t tarp off your floor. Um, that's, yeah, again, at the end of the day, that's, that's something that you can just learn all on YouTube. Yeah, it's just, it's all there. Uh, through experience, I learned. I hired people and I followed them. I learned from them. But as you encounter problems, you learn how to fix them. And then once you've dealt with the problem once or twice, it's quite easy to fix it a second or third time. Night, Brandon. Good to see you on. We're going to wrap this up soon anyway. Dang, I missed a lot of the math here. Uh, okay, I got that part. Love your frame of mind. Thanks. Appreciate that, Ryan. Also, for your first home, would you buy something that is move-in ready or would you take on a foreclosed property that needs a lipstick work? Um, it just depends on the deal. Like, Oftentimes, the deals are best. I, I found the best deals on properties that needed a lot of work. I've sometimes found really turnkey properties that have bad tenants in them then i've been able to get a good deal on but almost always the best deal on a property is because the property has a problem you have to solve no one's going to sell to you under market value a house that needs no work i despise when investors call me and say mike i want a burr that doesn't require a huge renovation it's like you're asking me to just give you a property under market value that needs no renovation needs no tenant eviction needs, has no problems if we're not solving a problem i'm just taking advantage of someone that's literally just me buying their house for less than it's worth. That feels unethical, that's not me. I will only buy a house for a good deal if I can add value to it. So through renovation, through removing tenants, putting better tenants in, maybe it's through duplexing the property, some some value add in some way that adds value. Um, yeah, so I, I think buying a property you, you could renovate and live in is a great way to learn how to renovate. So go ahead and buy, I, I think, buy a property that needs some, some cosmetic renovation and you'll learn a ton in the process. Michael Chung, hey Mike, when are we moving to Miami? <laughs> He's talking about uh, Ben Lala from uh, Concrete Life for Sale. Right. <laughs> so Graham Stephanie, if you're following his Instagram, was just hanging out with Ben Lala. I'm so jealous. I want to meet him. Um, I love his channel. He's, I think he actually has a good heart. He's just like a tough, rough exterior. The guy just, oh, he's crushing, crushing. Check out his channel. Uh, that's the reference there. By the way, like Michael Chung lives with me, so he's one of the mentees. Life run, cool, sounds good, I'll see your message. Duncan Abroad Films says, would you recommend buying rental properties if your goal is to be traveling? Also, how many rental properties must you own before a property manager becomes financially possible? So I think it only makes sense if your goal is to have really truly passive income, don't buy rental properties without a manager. Maybe you joint venture with someone like myself, um, who has a property management company or an active partner who can do all of the work, then it makes sense to travel. I think it makes no sense to buy properties. And, and it kind of, I, I like the real estate returns, right? Levered returns in real estate are really good, really high, even net of manager costs. So uh, I'm pro real estate. I'm pro buying rental properties. I would say to the number of properties you need, like you asked, the number of properties you need to have a manager make sense. I think depends on revenue. So in my area, like 10 duplexes or triplexes, you can almost justify a really low cost manager. Um, you get a full-time guy at like 25 kind of properties roughly, but you could get some friends together and share a manager between like the four of you guys. That's something you can think about doing. Uh, good question, good question. What's your opinion about Brit pop music? I have no comment. I have zero comment on that. Um, I like pretty much all music, but 
not my favorite. Why is Wealth Show? He was a companion. What? <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> bring any bring any question. <laughs> it doesn't make much sense, but might not get an answer. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Got to catch the rest in the replay. Have a good night. Night. In real estate, unlike stocks, everyday investors can move the needle on their returns through forced appreciation and adding extra bedrooms. In stocks, it's very hard to move the needle as an investor. My capital markets friend says that real estate is like a poor man's LBO. I found this very funny. What are your thoughts? Um, Antonio, good to see you on as well. Um, yeah, so Austin, good points. I mean, the thing, the thing that I like about... Um, I thought you meant leverage buyout, but... Uh, LBO, jump in the comments. I thought you meant leverage buyout, but I, I, I don't know. Um, jump in the comments with what LBO is supposed to mean in this context. I haven't heard that acronym before, but I was just kind of guessing. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that... Oh, I keep getting emails and texts coming in. Okay, so the thing with stocks that I don't like... So I'm talking about buying private businesses, right? That's like... The thing about this is there's no exposure. Like... This, this owner that's selling this business for a million bucks, no one knows about it, but like five people, you know, maybe he's told like his accountant and I've networked with a bunch of like lawyers and accountants and their lawyer accountant told me, Hey buddy wants to sell his business. He wants to retire and move to like Florida. Um, and so that's how I get in to see this business in the public space and public stocks. This business would, if this was like a publicly traded company or whatever, and it had been audited and was information was everywhere. There was no information asymmetry. Right? That's the thing I love about real estate, information asymmetry, when many parties don't know. In the public space, everything has to be disclosed by law. And so you, yeah, you basically, you just no opportunity for arbitrage. There's less opportunity for arbitrage. You're gonna pay a really high multiple because there's many bidders competing for the, for the deal. And also when you get into really smart, like a lot of smart finance guys, they can, they can whip magic with the, uh, with the valuations. So you end up paying a little bit more. Unfortunately, it's kind of my thought on that. Okay, yeah, yeah, LBO is a uh, leverage bio. That's what I thought, but I didn't want to, just in case it meant something different. Um, yeah, I mean, he's right. He's talking about stocks being like publicly traded stocks. It's really hard to, to get a great return. I mean, hard to, like when you're buying publicly traded stocks, you're trading on public information. You have no edge. Um, Jesus, people keep messaging me. You basically have no edge, and you rely on market returns. So you, you're basically gambling. But when you buy businesses like this, you're not gambling near as much because you're in control. I like to control whatever I'm invested in. So when I buy a business, I buy 51%, or I, I partner with someone, right? So that's kind of, um, I don't know. For me, at the end of the day, that, that's a big one. I, I like control, and real estate can provide that. Businesses can provide the exact same thing as real estate, but the poor man can't go and borrow 650000 they don't have the background, the bank won't lend to them until they've done a few real estate deals. Real estate is super beginner friendly, I think. You can just start with rent hacking, you know, you'll rent a place and sublet it on Airbnb, and then eventually you can go up to actually buying a house. So real estate's relatively um, approachable, I think, for the average person. I, I agree, I tend to agree. The problem is when you get into a re real estate recession, the next real estate recession is gonna be a lot of fun for me because people are gonna start losing their shirts. They're gonna start buying and they're gonna start losing money. They're gonna buy a market, and the market's gonna drop 5%, and they're gonna be 20,000 under market. As soon as that happens, the market just dries up, and listings sit on the market for two, three months. You can haggle and get really good deals. In this market, it's really hard to get good deals. You can't negotiate price down, because they got 10 offers on properties. It's making it really frustrating. Um, yeah, at the, at the end of the day, I love real estate, because you get cheap debt. When you borrow against businesses, like I'm gonna borrow like 7% here or something, right, on this capital. When I go and buy real estate, I can go borrow at three, three and a half percent. Um, Main Street, I think it's, it's Main Street. No, um, Meridian Credit Union is offering a one. They were offering a one point nine eight percent two year fixed rate on mortgages on your primary residence. One point nine eight percent to borrow two year fixed on your house. Go borrow seven hundred thousand dollars at one point nine eight percent. What? Like that's the beauty of real estate. At the end of the day, um, are we still plugged in. My phone just like died. Yeah. Am I still live even right now? Can anyone still see me? Am I still connected? It's completely frozen. It's because I'm getting, my phone's getting ravaged by texts. 
it just froze up. We hear you, but no visual. Okay, so my camera crashed. 